as I think about our text, our passage, I think that the oncoming of the American Civil War appropriately illustrates what we're going to see in the text. By early 1861, February, March, and certainly by early April, the United States, or I should really say the North American continent, was bound for war. It was inevitable. There were two sides facing off against each other, and it was certain that they would ultimately clash. It was just a matter of when and how. The Civil War became inevitable when the South was determined to sustain its sovereignty. Remember, they had broken away from the Union, from the United States, and they were determined even by force to sustain what they saw as their government. And the federal government in Washington was at least equally determined to do what they saw as restoring federal order in the South. And neither side was going to back down. Observers in the United States noticed that, and certainly observers around the world were watching with curiosity. The nation was a tinderbox and was sure to ignite. Likewise, in the gospel story, Jesus represented the fulfillment of God's long-awaited plan for redemption. But outwardly, to these Jewish religious leaders here, the Pharisees, he represented something radically new, radically different from all that they were accustomed to. He threatened their whole enterprise, and they became determined to remove the threat at all costs. Jesus knew their intentions and where they would ultimately lead through God's providence, but he was determined to obey all to which he had agreed with the Father. And thus, these two parties were bound to clash. I've titled this sermon, Showdown on the Sabbath. Jesus' statement, the last and final verse that we saw last week in chapter 2, verse 28, had represented an escalation going on through the book of Mark. It was an escalation in the professed authority of Jesus. He has authority, it said, even over the Sabbath, thus even over the law of God, the law given through Moses. And this is a profound claim. God instituted the Sabbath at creation in Genesis 2, in verse 3, he gives it to the people of Israel after that in the law of Moses, clarifying on it and putting it in context for the, the theocratic nation of Israel. And only God himself then could be the Lord of the Sabbath. Do you see the weight then of what Jesus is saying in, when he calls himself Lord of the Sabbath? Following this claim by Jesus that he is Lord of the Sabbath, Mark is going to further illuminate and now this, this second Sabbath confrontation in chapter 3. So please turn there, Mark 3. Thus, the showdown on the Sabbath. We're going to look at verses 1 through 6. Mark showcases Jesus as the Lord of the Sabbath. He, that is Jesus, confounds the Pharisees, confronts their callousness, and shows the priority of mercy for the Sabbath. Let's read the text together. Again, he entered the synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. And they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, come here. And he said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. And he looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, and said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. As Lord of the Sabbath, Jesus confronts hypocrisy and models mercy. I believe our response to this text would be to acknowledge Jesus as Lord, Lord of all, and embrace the priority of extending mercy, even as we uphold the Sabbath as given by the Lord. Let's pray. Our God, we thank you for your word that you've so revealed it to us. I pray, God, that it would go forth clearly, that we would understand it. God, that our hearts would be open. Holy Spirit, work among us. Oh God, and if there are any among us, that are still in their sins and do not know you, I pray you would awaken them even today. In your holy name, amen. 
like last week, there are three main actions in our text, and they'll follow as my points. First is the Pharisees' scheme. Jesus confounds, and the die is cast. So we'll begin with number one, the Pharisees' scheme. You'll notice, and you could probably feel it, we're going into a new scene. It's probably not immediately related to what we saw. They're related thematically because they're both about the Sabbath, and Mark is making a a greater point. It's not sequential, in other words, necessarily. He uh, joins these because of the way they dress the Sabbath. And though uh, these two accounts, or through these two accounts, Mark further illuminates who Jesus is. As the Lord of the Sabbath, he sets in motion the conflict with these religious leaders that will ultimately lead to the cross. Remember, in the book of Mark, this is true of all the Gospels, but particularly in Mark, the cross is always in the background. Would you look at verse 1 with me? Again, he entered the synagogue, this is Jesus, and a man was there with a withered hand. So the scripture tells us that he, Jesus, is at the synagogue on the Sabbath. That's what we would expect, isn't it? Jesus gathers weekly for worship, something that would have been a long tradition by Second Temple Judaism in the first century by the time we see there, much like we do today. God's people would gather for reading of the scriptures, for preaching, for prayer, for worship, in other words. And so Jesus is there doing that. And even in all the conflict that we've seen, both last week and what we're seeing here, having read it, in no way will we see that Jesus abrogates or cancels the Sabbath. He's there at the synagogue on the Sabbath. It's given by God. Instead, we see Jesus honoring its intent and he's going, to inclar- he's going to clarify and illuminate its intent. He does m- much like what he does in the Sermon on the Mount, clarifying, you have heard it said this, but I say to you, and he's clarifying the intent of what God has already said in his word. Again, a profound statement about who he is. It's his authority as he speaks that so awes the people. Notice here, it seems to sort of be by ha- happenstance that this man is here. I say happenstance because it seems to be that way outwardly. And if this were just the story, we might just sort, of, just sort of breeze over that and just assume that it's sort of random. But we know that nothing is random with God. God has designed this confrontation for his own purpose. That should give us a sense of peace and hope that nothing that happens in this life, nothing that happens in this world is random. Nothing is ever out of control. Nothing is ever spontaneous in the sense of having no cause before it. Nothing is truly random. Nothing occurs without God's oversight. But at the same time, consider how drastically different that is from the worldview of those in our community. They pretty much do see the world as random. If anything, it might be mechanical. They might see it sort of as a naturalistic machine almost. But it's meaningless in other words. So you see, what we believe in the scriptures, what we believe as Christians, is opposed diametrically to what the worldview is around us. So we're not shocked by that when we confront that. We recognize that. We understand it. We want to understand the context around us as we seek to be salt and light. God, have no doubt, is sovereign over all of the affairs of the world. And in that, we rejoice. Look at verse 2 now. And they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath, note, so that they might accuse him. It's very clear here that the Pharisees are watching him ever so closely. Initially, we don't know who the they is, at least at that that point in verse 2, the pronoun they is is vague to us. But the story bears it out that these are the Pharisees. Not necessarily the same Pharisees that we saw before, but they're part of that same camp. This word that's used here, to speak of them uh, watching closely, denotes watching very closely, peering, watching intently. They're waiting for any opportunity to undermine Jesus. It's something like when uh, I grade papers. Uh, I did it plenty of, of the, the time when I was in Louisville, and I do it now for our guys that are in our class And for guys that are going into education for the first time, uh, especially beyond college, when you get into the seminary level, the graduate level, it's hard for people to adjust to receiving criticism on their work. 
But they find that I want to help them by looking at everything they say in the paper. I'm looking at their syntax. I'm looking at their mechanics of their grammar. I'm looking at their writing style. I'm looking, are there any holes in their argument? Does it have cohesion? And I'm going to point out every error that's there going through it with a fine tooth comb so that I can help them be better at it. But I'm watching it closely. I'm looking at everything. And if I can, I don't want to miss anything. Well, the Pharisees are following that philosophy. They are watching Jesus intently. Anything he does to give them grounds, they're going to take it up. The Pharisees are peering closely, just waiting. They're bent on taking him down, the scriptures show us. You know, Mark is unambiguous as he reveals their motives. Last week, I, I wanted to give them some credit and say, maybe, maybe they are just zealous for the law. Maybe they are. Is there any possibility of that? But by the time we get here into this passage, as I even mentioned last week, looking forward to today, it's very clear what their motives are. And Jesus knows their intentions too. The language here of so that communicates that accusing him was their goal all along. There's no doubt. They show the hardness of their hearts, not only in their posture to Jesus, I've emphasized that to this point, but how else? Notice that they have absolutely no concern for this man with the deformity, none. None. He's just a pawn in their scheme to hopefully take down Jesus. No concern whatsoever. Interestingly, they have no doubt that Jesus can heal him. That says something. They're confident that if Jesus so works that he can heal this man, and yet they don't care. How can that be? I mean, think about that today. Again, don't don't think, oh, these, these ancient people, they thought that miracles and magic happened all the time. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. Look at Thomas. Look how, how, look how skeptical the disciples were over and over and over. They weren't stupid. They knew that these things didn't just spontaneously happen. So the fact that the Pharisees believed that Jesus really was a wonder worker must have said something. And yet their hearts are so hard. They're driven by their evil hearts. On one hand, I'm emphasizing the evil intent within their hearts. But on the other hand, we would not think that this should at all be exceptional. We, on, again, on one hand, we can look at the Pharisees, and by now we should look at the Pharisees and say, look at the hardness of their hearts. And yet this isn't just the Pharisees. We're, we're merely seeing Mark highlighting it here, but this hardness of heart is characteristic of the world without Christ. The Pharisees are not concerned with the Sabbath as much as they'd like you to think that they are. That's not truly what's at work here. This flavor of legalism, and there are many different flavors of legalism even today, but the flavor of legalism that we see here is not actually concerned with upholding righteousness. These men are concerned with their own power and influence. If it were otherwise, they would not demonstrate the hypocrisy that we see in verse 6. And by the time we get there, it is so clear. We can almost smell it. It's the same sort of hypocrisy that we see oftentimes with the Islamic radicals. And maybe you're not aware of this, but so often, and of course you know that groups like ISIS and the Taliban and Al-Qaeda and so on, they have very strict rules against no Western culture, no Western music, no Western dress, no Western movies, nothing, especially if it's American. It's all evil, it's wicked, it's of the devil, none. And yet so often they find in these captains' places stashes of music from the 1980s. They find movies from the United States, you know, from the 1970s. They find these things of Western culture that these guys are okay with. They're just not okay with everyone else having it. It's hypocrisy. Don't you dare listen to Western music. We will kill you. And then they're listening to, I don't know, some pop from 1995, you know. They're listening to Britney Spears or something. That's the sort of hypocrisy that we see here in the Pharisees. They could avoid something, they think, by blaming it on the Sabbath. We don't care about this guy with the withered hand because it's the Sabbath. We're more holy. We care about honoring God. And they put on this sham. This is a warning for us, too. That we should never put up a front to do evil by using pious pretenses. It's so easy for us to do that. Athanasius, an early church father from North Africa, He says this, if he, this man, was withered in his hand, the ones who stood by were withered in their minds. Just think about this on the side. 
if Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, would he really be breaking God's law? That's an important question to ask. Would he really be breaking God's law? Would he be sinning? More profoundly, what would that actually mean if he had? Athanasius, again, is helpful on this. He reminds us that Jesus is the one who gave the law. Can he not also point out an exception? I would add and clarify, can Jesus not clarify the very intent of the law? It's his after all. Of course he can. Jesus hadn't transgressed the the law of God. Don't misunderstand. I want to be very clear in that. He would merely transgress the interpretive additions to the law that the rabbis had added to the word of God. So he's not breaking the law that is in the scriptures. He's breaking the customs that the Jews had surrounded it with that by the first century was so thick. He did not transgress the law itself. The scriptures tell us that he was holy, blameless, and undefiled, completely without fault. Jesus came to fulfill the law. Yes, we must not miss that. He did not come to throw it out. And even as some parts of the Old Testament law would be fulfilled in a way that they would be put to rest and ultimately given their full purpose, for instance, the sacrificial system. We no longer sacrifice. Why? Because Christ is our sacrifice once for all. And so in that instance, those things have been laid away. But the Sabbath will have an enduring observance as we wait for Christ's return when he will take his people into eternal rest. So yes, there is a very real way in which Christ fulfills the Sabbath and that he is our Sabbath. But yet not until it is consummated, until he returns, are we really at rest, are we? But then when he returns, we will enter that rest perfectly. In this first action, the Pharisees scheme. They're looking for further cause and opportunity to bring down Jesus. But Jesus is not caught unaware. So here's number two. Jesus confounds. Would you look at verse three? And he said to the man with the withered hand, come here. See, Jesus calls him into the center in front of everyone. Jesus could have, if he wanted, waited till after the service, right? If, if it was only a matter of compassion, Jesus could have maybe taken him in the corner or without anyone even realizing it. He could have just spoke and the man's hand would have been healed without making any public scene. But Jesus isn't trying to hide anything, is he? Come here to the sinner in front of everyone, he says. He intentionally then is confronting the Pharisees. He knows the game they're playing. Jesus is never caught off guard in the Gospels. And through this, the Holy Spirit teaches us about Jesus' lordship and about the Sabbath. John Chrysostom, another early church father, says this. Note the tender compassion of the Lord when he deliberately brought the man with the withered hand right into their presence. This is the Pharisees, right into the presence of the Pharisees. In a sense, the man with a withered hand is actually a background figure here. Usually when you look at, in your scripture, in the Bible, you'll see that there's a little caption oftentimes for the section. It probably says a man with a withered hand. But he's actually not the center of attention here. He's sort of the occurrence, the case, in this confrontation between Jesus and his opponents. But that is not to say that Jesus doesn't care about this man or his deformity. Chrysostom says again, perhaps the sad state of this man might soften their hearts. But no, they were callous. And we can ask that maybe maybe when they see this man in his desperation, the Pharisees would realize that they've just been so concerned about their own evil intent and they would have compassion on him too. But no, they're callous. The scripture shows us that Jesus sought him out. Notice that, uh, that the man doesn't seem to seek out Jesus for healing at all. He doesn't raise his hand. He doesn't call out, son of David, come heal me. This seems to be the only place in Mark where Jesus heals someone who doesn't ask. Jesus had not been looking for the opportunity to heal someone necessarily, but when he encountered the need, when Jesus encountered the need, he responded. He did not look away and he met the need. Implicitly then for us, As Christians, something we take away from this 
is that we have some responsibility to meet the needs that we encounter in concert with our ability to meet those needs. We should ask ourselves, is it within our means to meet this need that we encounter in our daily lives? But beyond that, secondly, we should consider our own proximity. How close are we to that need? Those needs that are nearest to us should have priority for us rather than those far away. We, sadly, we, we sometimes use the adage, you know, with our children, we could say, yeah, there are starving kids in Africa that would love that food if, if, if they had it, but, but you won't even eat it. And we, we sort of, sadly, sort of undermine, I think, the fact that there are millions of starving kids perhaps. But there's no way, even for all of us in this room, to meet all those needs, is there? But we can meet those needs nearest us. When someone shows up at our door, we had two Again, seemingly, by happenstance, show up on our property yesterday. Both of them had significant needs. And so we sought to meet those needs. If we have someone at work, if we have a neighbor, if we have a friend, those needs closest to us should receive the most attention within us considering what what means do we have to meet those needs. If we simply do not have the means, then the guilt is not on us. My daughter, Dixie, is just, on one hand, she's just very thoughtful, but just she's getting to that age where she's very observant, uh, and she's learning how to read, which makes things interesting. Uh, we, as I don't have to tell you, we live in a very needy community here, and so she constantly sees homeless people walking by. She sees people that just very clearly, for instance, again, these two people that came yesterday very clearly have needs just by the outward. She sees people standing on the street corner with signs begging for food. And again, she can read their signs now. And she said, Mommy, yesterday, that sign says, need food, help me. I said, Mommy, can't we, can't we go help them? And on one hand, we never want to discourage her from that. It is a good impulse. We want her in no way to be um, separated from those things or to be callous against those things. But we also have to tell her, Dixie, there are, there are thousands of homeless people in this city And we want to help those whom we can, but we we can't help everyone. You know, even what Jesus says, that the poor will always be with us. And so there's a sense in which we can't meet every need. But those needs nearest us, we should consider first because of their proximity, and we meet needs in concert with our ability. We're going to come back to that. Look at verse 4. Verse 4 says, And he said to them, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm? to save life or to kill, but they were silent. Their response is telling. Jesus asks this question. It's sort, of, it's sort of that Jesus says, oh, you want to talk about Sabbath theology? I know a thing or two about Sabbath theology. In fact, I created it. Yeah, let's talk about that. I've heard your case, and now let me share, he says. One commentator, Stein, says, Jesus turns the tables on his opponents for their opposition to Jesus' forthcoming action. You notice that last week as I sort of described this, uh, this verbal judo move that Jesus put on them. And he does it again asking them this very provoking question. Jesus uses, to use a, a big phrase, antithetical parallelism. Just, just look the way he says it here. Is it right to do good, so an extreme, or harm? Is it right to save life or to kill? Stein offers, again, a a possible explanation for this saying. Doing good and saving life meant to bring wholeness from the curse of the fall and the disease and sickness that resulted from the fall. So you see there's gospel in the background there. Jesus might also be referring to the intent, the heart of the people there. Remember, they actually intend to kill, and that's not figurative. We see that by the end. I know that to sort of to soften it, the passage says to destroy in verse 6, but it's the same word for kill. And we know that that's not hyperbole by the time we get to the end of the book. They intend to kill. What's the bigger point here? I've looked at these things very closely, and we're not done. We've got other details to look at, but what is the bigger picture here? We don't want to miss that. One commentator says, Mark wants his readers to see the issue as, and he asks a question, does Jesus, the son of man, have authority as Lord of the Sabbath? Think back to 2.28. To do good and to heal on the Sabbath. What do you think? 
How would you answer that question? Does Jesus really have this authority? In other words, is Jesus really Lord? Mark is not primarily addressing a question about Sabbath observance. That's, that's in the background. That's important. But ultimately, this is a question about who Jesus is. One commentator says, it requires a decision about who Jesus is and what is the source of his authority. Again, their, their response is so telling. The text says that they were silent. In their case, their silence demonstrates their own guilt. They have nothing to say. It's like when I ask my kids when something's been broken, I say, Dixie, did you break that? And if she has nothing to say, there's my answer. If she's innocent, she'd say, oh, no, Dad, I didn't break that. I'm, I'm not sure who did. But if she's guilty and she's afraid about the consequences of that, she might just, you know, give me one of those. Jackson, did you hit your sister? And if he's, if he's not guilty, he'd say, no, I didn't. But if he is, he'll usually stare at me and look like he's about to cry. <laughs> their silence demonstrates their guilt. Stein says, the silence of Jesus' opponents demonstrate Jesus' great authority because he has refuted his opponents and driven them into silence. They cannot answer the power and wisdom of his reply. I know that I've won a debate with someone when my opponent has nothing further to say. So when I've given answers and when I've given proofs and he has no way to respond, I know I've won. If he continues, then I have to continue fighting and answering and then giving my own proof and so on. Jesus is sort of doing uh, the mic drop, right? Boom. They have nothing to say. Jesus says, I've said my piece. I've made my point. Mic drop. Stein says, even though the Sabbath and its regulations were one of the identifying marks of Judaism, Jesus has authority over the Sabbath. Jesus' authority is further demonstrated by the silencing of his opponents. So for the Pharisees, this isn't about the holiness of the Sabbath. It's an issue of their heart. It's bent on evil. And think about the irony that is embedded here. How ironic that those who outwardly claim to follow God in all things, in all righteousness, they are the direct opponents of God's redemptive mission for his own people. How sad. How sad. But at the same time, this will not stop God from using these men for his own means, for his own ends. The Pharisees scheme, but Jesus confounds confounds. The third and lastly, the die is cast. Look at verse 5. And he looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, and said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. Look at what the text says there. The Holy Spirit tells us through Mark that Jesus was angry. Does, does that surprise you? Maybe this doesn't fit with your conception of Jesus as being angry. Certainly there are many well-meaning religious people in our society that have no room for a conception of Jesus that includes anger. Again, they think of Jesus as sort of this happy-go-lucky hippie or he's sort of the grandfather on the porch that is sort of senile, doesn't know what's going on, but he's really nice. He did some stuff a long time ago. But look, here it is so plainly. Jesus was angry. And that word is a strong word. In the original language, it's even stronger. It denotes wrath. Church, just in general, as we think about this principle, be on guard not to let the sentimental spirit of the age determine who you conceive of God to be. In this sense, it's sort of, again, sort of this new age sentimentality of whatever. It could be other things. But why should we ever trust culture or philosophy, for that matter, to tell us something that God's word is revealed so plainly? Look to the scriptures to know who God is. The person who goes into the woods to find God is a fool. 
look to the scriptures. The scriptures tell us who God is. And Jesus embodies all who God is perfectly. I want to make this note, though, that Jesus' anger here is not spontaneous. It's cumulative. It has been building. It's been building over these encounters. When we speak about God being angry here, Jesus, who is God in flesh, we're never implying that God sort of flies off the handle. It's not what we mean. Augustine, important early church father, also from North Africa, says this. When we see Jesus' anger directed at its proper object, we learn that all forms of anger are not vice. The word wrath here, again, is, is appropriate. It actually does a good job of explaining not just what's embedded, what's in the meaning of this ancient word, but just in, even what's in the context here. One cannot read the scriptures and believe that God is not characterized by wrath, but it is a holy wrath. His wrath is directed against unrighteousness. And why? Precisely because he's good, not the other way around. God's wrath in no way undermines his goodness. It is precisely because of his goodness. Why would we ever worship a God that we didn't believe would bring wrath and judgment against Hitler, against Stalin, against the, the serial child molester? Why would, we, why would we worship a God that was not truly good? Our God is good, and he will bring justice one day. We're accustomed more so to fleshly anger. And so that, that sort of anger is not what is going on here. So that we, we rightly say, no, that does not characterize of God. God's anger is not a product of pride. It's not a product of raw impulse or a lack of control. It's not a product of selfishness. It's a product of his holiness. You know, we too, as we seek to be like God, as we seek to be made in the image of Christ through sanctification, we too should be angry about sin. We too should be angry at sin. Now, anger does not equal hatred of persons, but it might mean holy anger against persons doing evil. Not hatred, but appropriate godly anger. Let me give you a few examples. We should rightfully be angry at ISIS. Brutally, murdering, butchering, destroying. If they're not a tool of the devil, what is? We should be angry at that when we see people slaughtered. We should be angry when we see daily murder of children in the womb, what we call abortion. We should be angry at that. It's evil, it's wicked, and it will bring the justice of God. We should be angry about racism in our country and the injustices that go along with it. We should rightfully be angry about those things. But it's an anger that is inspired by God's holiness and goodness. But we know what happens in the gospel. The, the story that we often share of the gospel is we would share with someone. We know that it begins with us standing under God's wrath, doesn't it? Ephesians 2, verse 3 says that we are children of wrath. He says, likewise, like all of mankind, all of us are children of wrath by our nature and by our own sin. The biblical perspective of God's wrath against sin is frightening, and it should be frightening. That God will destroy the wicked in his holy wrath when he returns to judge the earth. I sat with a young woman yesterday and shared that, not just to inflict fear for the sake of sensationalism, but out of care and concern and out of belief in God's goodness and justice against wrath for which is not, that is not atoned for. He will judge the earth, but, but on the cross, God poured out his wrath, all of his wrath against sin on his own son who was pure and holy, a sufficient offering to pay the penalty the sufficient penalty for sin for his people. And so you see that in the gospel. We see both of those. 
We see the evil, the ugliness, the, the, the wrath that is due against sin. And yet we see how God poured that out on his son so that his people, so that we would not have to receive that. And that is available to all who will come, to all who will believe. Note what the text says here. It says that Jesus was grieved, right in connection with anger. Jesus was grieved, it says. He was grieved at what? At the hardness of their hearts. You know, he's never surprised by it, but such rebellion continues to grieve God. Continues to grieve him. It's possible that some among us have hard hearts toward God that have not been softened by his work. If that's you, if you are still in that place where you still have a hard heart, you are resisting the gospel, you are resisting repentance, you are resisting the lordship of Christ, for the sake of your soul, I pray that God softens your heart and that he would renew you. It's a work that only the Holy Spirit is sufficient to do because of the work in Christ. Because of that payment that was given in Christ at the cross, it is available R.T. France, one commentator, says this. This phrase, hardness of heart, is used in the New Testament to refer to those who will not perceive of truth. The text tells us that Jesus fixed his attention on the man in need. So notice what we see here together. Paired with God's wrath, we see his immense compassion. Remember, Jesus says he came to call the sick, not those who think themselves to be righteous. This man is sick. And so it says the man is healed. And I even, I hesitate to to say that. The the grammarian in me doesn't like using the passive voice. It it masks the agency of who's doing the act. The, The scripture doesn't say that Jesus healed him or that God healed him or that anyone healed him. It says that he was healed. So we don't know who is doing the action. We don't know who the subject is, but that's intentional. It's on purpose. We oftentimes call this the divine passive. I think that's what this is. How could they possibly call this work so as to, so as to violate the Sabbath? Ultimately, Jesus heals the man, but he does so without a touch, without even a motioning of his hand, without asking anything of the man. How does that constitute work, honestly? And thus it's even said in the passive there. Athanasius says, Jesus openly healed merely through speaking so as to avoid the charge of working on the Sabbath. Church, Jesus is not, he's not seeking to overthrow God's law. He's certainly not trying to raise controversy for no reason. God did not say, don't speak on the Sabbath. It's not there. And that's all that Jesus has done. Jesus uses this to teach what the Sabbath is. You see that in the text. Jesus is not anti-Sabbath. He's he's not seeking to to remove the Sabbath. He's seeking to go against the foolishness and the abuse of the Sabbath that we see here in the Pharisees. Notice that the scriptures tell us that the Sabbath is for good. Jesus demonstrates the blessedness for which the Sabbath exists. Now think about this for us. What does this mean for us? That we do good as opportunity arises, even on the Sabbath. That we can serve God, honoring the holiness of this day as instituted even in creation by doing good deeds of mercy in relation, again, to our proximity, I think is helpful, and in relation to our own means. Last week, Jesus said that the Sabbath is for man. It's not a cumbersome system of works. Much like Jesus does in the Sermon on the Mount, as I said earlier, he's going to clarify the intent of this law. Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. Look at verse 6. The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. You believe that? These Pharisees are bent on killing him. Earlier, what 
they might have been willing to sort, of, to sort of deal with this upstart teacher. Maybe they thought they could persuade him. Maybe they thought he would just sort of go away. Maybe he would go down to Jerusalem. But there's no longer any question about what is in their hearts. It's evil. It's evil. Notice who they join. They join with this unlikely group for help. Who are these? Do you know who the Herodians are? It says they join with the Herodians. Actually, it's not totally clear to us who these Herodians are. They're not a Jewish sect. That seems to be clear. They're probably some sort of aristocratic family in Galilee, perhaps even across Israel, that would have been very favorable towards Herod. And so what an interesting place for them to pair. Remember, Herod was sort of an agent of Rome. And so they're going to these guys that are pro-Roman, it shows something of their desperation. They'll do anything to take this guy down. They'll even go with their enemies. You know, as they say, my enemy's enemy is my friend. Friend of my enemy is my friend. No, I'm getting that wrong. The enemy of, the friend of my enemy, I don't know. You know what I'm saying. <laughs> I said it sufficiently the first time. But what an interesting thing. And now look here how clear. They plan to kill him. This shows Mark's readers that Jesus was going to the cross innocently. Mark intends to demonstrate that. Because perhaps some would say, yeah, Jesus went to the cross, but he deserved it. He must have been a real criminal. We don't want to follow him. He he was crucified by the Romans. Surely he was a wicked man. And yet Mark is showing he was guilty of nothing. Even from an earthly perspective, even if we put all the theological aside, he was guilty of nothing but showing compassion to someone in need. Church Mark is emphasizing that Jesus understood all along why he came into the world. The cross was not an afterthought. It was certainly not a mistake. It came about through God's providence. Indeed, it was decided in eternity by a covenant made between the persons of the Trinity to redeem fallen humanity. Church, the scriptures present the Sabbath as a creation ordinance given at creation, even before the law of Moses in Genesis 2 and verse 3. Other creation ordinances would be marriage and dominion of the earth, these things given by God even before the law of Moses, and those things that in a sense transcend. Jesus claims to be the Lord of the Sabbath. And Mark Strauss, one commentator says this, it's very helpful. He says, what an audacious claim. Considering that the Sabbath principle was established by God at creation and arose directly from the rest, uh, from the rest on the seventh day, Genesis 2-3. God alone is creator and so Lord of the Sabbath. Yet, Jesus claims this prerogative for himself as the Son of Man. As the Lord of the Sabbath, Jesus confronts hypocrisy and models mercy. May we respond by acknowledging Jesus as Lord, Lord of all, and embracing the priority of extending mercy even as we seek to uphold the Lord's day as holy. Let's pray.